beginning of his talk, we will see something new, exciting, never shown in public before. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to, to hear the whole presentation. Uh, please welcome with me here on Digital Dragons 2016, Ed Freeze. Yeah, it's okay? <laughs> All right, does this work? Oh, it's working great, okay. I love this stage, this stage is awesome. <laughs> um, it's my first time in Poland. Uh, I actually, uh, I, I left Seattle uh, Saturday, which was my birthday, and flew out here, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I won't say uh, what year, but you're, you're gonna figure it out in a second here, because uh, it's in my talk, but. Uh, uh, anyway, um, I'm a huge fan of uh, Witcher 3, and so when, when I got asked to come out here, I was like, sure, I'd love to, love to come to Poland. So anyway, uh, you guys ready to get started? Yeah. yeah? Okay, wait, first, are there, are there people here who know kind of retro games, old stuff? A few? Okay, because I have a few. I can either just show you this stuff, but there's a few places I can ask questions if people think they know the history of games pretty well, because this is, you're going to learn about the history of games in this talk, okay? All right, so a few people s claim they know, so we'll see. We'll see how, uh, we'll see how it goes. So we're going to start in the beginning. In the beginning, there was darkness <laughs> in the void. And then Steve the Slug Russell from MIT in 1962 said, let there be light. And he created a sun and stars and gravity. And he put two spaceships locked in an endless struggle around that star. And he called it Space War. And it was good. It was the first good video game. <laughs> 1962. There they are. I was born two years later, 1964. That's my older brother, a twin sister and me. Um, I'm the wiggly one in the stroller. I always had trouble sitting still. Um, uh, you know, it, from then on, sort of my life and, uh, and, and the game industry, we kind of grew up together. Uh, uh, but for a while, games weren't around. There were, you know, as a kid, I grew up, there were no games. Uh, I had to play with frogs and whatever I could get my hands on. You know, I was just waiting for video games to uh, become available, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, there were a few things I could uh, get my hands on. Uh, there was a lot of science fiction, fantasy I could read. There were a few TV shows we could watch back in the day that had something to do with what would become video games. There was also this reality show going on at that time uh, that, was, uh, that also was pretty inspirational for a lot of us. But 1971, this game came out a game called Computer Space. Uh, this was the first home, or the first commercially produced arcade game. And this was made by Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney. And they were trying to imitate the space war that was created at MIT uh, as, a, as an arcade game. Next year, Ralph Baer's Magnavox Odyssey came out. And so video games were starting to become available didn't really see too many of them yet. Actually, what I saw, I see, I grew up in a house where both my parents were engineers. My dad was an electrical engineer, my mom was a chemical engineer, and then she went back to school and got a master's in computer science. And so they would bring stuff home, and that was my first exposure to this technology. My dad would bring home the, this programmable calculator that, I don't know, must have cost thousands of dollars back then. And uh, you could put these little mag, mag uh, strips through it and uh, load programs that way. So you could play Lunar Lander just on, on the display. Um, Dad and I built this little uh, hex keypad 6800 system, and I learned how to program in assembly language. Actually, the first assembly language programming I did was on this, which I bet nobody here has seen. This is a cardboard computer called the Cardiac that Bell Labs put out as a teaching tool, and you could program on this cardboard machine, and it actually worked. You would slide the little sliders to enter your opcodes, and then move the little program counter bug, and it's actually a great way to learn how a computer really worked. But by 1977, the real personal computers were coming out. 
Apple II, TRS-80, the PET. Um, again, I still, they, they were still hard for me to get my hands on. I had to get on my bike and ride to Radio Shack if I wanted to touch one of these computers. Uh, but my mom would bring stuff home. By then, she was working at DEC. She would bring home something like this. This is a printing terminal for people who've never seen one before. And so uh, you call up over a modem to a mainframe, and then you could play games on this. You type, just like typing on a typewriter, and then the, and then the game would spit out back on, on the printout what you were doing. So that's where I first played games like Zork and the original adventures, perfect for text adventures. Um, 1976, the arcade business is still moving forward. Uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak create this game before they go off to start Apple. Um, arcade business continues. Here you see Space Wars influence again, 1977. This, <laughs> this was created by, a, anyway, it's a long story. I don't have time to tell you. I could tell you after if somebody asked me a question about it. But um, anyway, again, uh, when, when Space War came out, this time as an arcade game, it became the number one selling arcade game in the country. Um, and arcade games keep, kept just improving. By 1981, I'm in high school, and my high school was, as it happened, just down the street from Nintendo's North American Distribution Center. So we had some of the very first Nintendo arcade games in our high school, which was really kind of a silly thing for the administrators to do. Uh, I, People like me would just blow all their lunch money on these arcade machines, but we had a Donkey Kong and we had a Scramble, and again, another early influence for me. Um, but we also had Apple IIs at school, and so finally there were personal computers that I could touch pretty much every day. Does anybody here, can anyone here tell me what game this is? Nope. It's Wizardry. Wizardry, yeah, and Wizardry was, was uh, you know, one of the first uh, PC RPGs, fantastic game on the Apple II. Um, I wanted an Apple II, but my dad got me an Atari instead, and it turned out that that was actually a great thing. I, I fell in love with this machine. I kind of, you know, just disappeared off the face of the map the second half of high school, and, and just was programming this machine constantly, first in basic and then assembly language. You know, and for me, the hardest thing was trying to decide what to make. And so I just started imitating games that I would see. Oh, here, let me talk about a few real quick games on this machine. This is Star Raiders, kind of the classic, uh, classic game for that machine. Here's another game, Mule. If you've never seen this game, this is probably one of the best games of all time. So it's worth reading up about Mule. Um, Here's a few really early games that I did uh, in assembly language. I did my own version of Space Wars. There you see Space War again showing up. Um, and I did a Frogger clone that I called Froggy. And again, I was just making these for fun for my friends. Froggy, um, just, you, you also have to remember that this is a world before the internet, right? So even if you made something like this, how would you, what would you do with it? Well. Um, there were things called bulletin boards, and people could upload things to a bulletin board by dialing up a local, calling a local phone number, and then it would get downloaded by other people and it could spread around the country. Froggy made its way around until it, it came down to California, and a, a game company in California saw it, and they tracked it back to me, and somehow in 1981, they found the guy who made this game. I have no idea how. I mean, I'm a high school kid. I'm not in the phone book or anything. I'm working at a pizza place at night and going to school and, and you know programming whenever I can. But anyway, they found me and they hired me and all of a sudden um, I was working for this company called Ramox, which was awesome <laughs> as a kid who loved games and uh, you know, was, uh, now had a chance to actually make them as a job. Um, and, and when I say a job, I was working freelance for them and uh, going to school. I, I graduated high school and started into college. Um, and, you know, here's a quick look at what these games look like. Um, you know, so that's what happened with Froggy. They were afraid we were going to get sued, so they made me change it into having a medieval theme. I had to take the cars out and replace them with jousting knights. Um, but I still got to keep the frog. I don't know why. But anyway, this is the second game I made, which was kind of a Dig Dug clone. You were an ant, and you had to try to get these sugar cubes and bring them back. Um, and, and then I did a game called Sea Chase. 
Anyway, so by then I'm, a, I'm in college and I'm using the royalty money that I'm getting from these games to help pay for college. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's about 1984. Does anybody here remember what happened to the game industry in 1984? <laughs> Vlad knows. <laughs> here, let me show you a graph. This is an interesting graph. Up here I can walk up to it. Um, this red line is the uh, amount of dollars that were being made in the consumer game industry. And you can see it peaked in 1982 at right around $9 billion. And by 1985, it went down to almost $0. <laughs> the entire game industry melted down. It's a, it's a famous uh, story from the past of the game industry. So if you were making games then, you probably weren't making games a few years later. And that's what happened to me. Um, Ramux went away. So, so I'm in college. I'm halfway through getting a computer science degree. And I need some money to pay for school. So I talked the uh, guys at the computer center into giving me a job running their VAX 11750. I became a Unix administrator, and I was programming in C and running this machine. And I thought I was done with the games business forever. Uh, that machine also had some great games. Does anyone know this game? Very famous game. Has in Say it again. Rogue is correct. Yes, Rogue, this is the game that made all the roguelikes that everybody has now today. It came from Rogue. And you should go back and play the original Rogue because it's better than most of the roguelikes. <laughs> but anyway. Um, okay, so, you know, still I need a job. I got to have money. Uh, I, when I'm getting back, uh, back to my hometown, which is Bellevue, Washington, uh, every summer, um, I applied to a little local software company there called Microsoft. And uh, in the summer of 85, they were pretty small. They were about 800 people. They weren't the biggest software company, uh, microcomputer software company in the world back then. Um, but anyway, they hired me. I worked as a summer intern, summer of 85, and they liked the job that I did. And so, um, so they offered me a full-time job when I graduated the next year, 86. Um, this guy hires me, and he puts me on this project called Excel. And I was the seventh programmer to j join this team. And we were, you know, our job was to beat this giant company called Lotus, uh, we made a product called Lotus123. Uh, very popular spreadsheet. Uh, and there were seven guys trying to do it. Um, well, we had fun. Uh, we worked really hard and uh, made, a, made a good product, made the first version of uh, Excel for Windows about uh, 18 months later and then multiple versions of Excel, and the team grew from seven to 15 to 50 programmers, and I became the lead programmer by then. But, you know, when I wasn't at work, um, you know, I'm a gamer at heart, so I'm back home playing all the latest games, and it was a great time to be a gamer. You know, uh, Battletech, uh, you know, the first mech game. Uh, this is a game, does people know what this game? Populous is correct. Uh, Peter Molyneux's first really big game uh, by 1990, Chris Roberts' Wing Commander, 91, Sid Meier's Civilization, and so on. And so I'm playing all these games, and I'm making Excel, and that's pretty much my life. Um, and my boss, uh, we did a really good job on Excel, and so my boss gets promoted to go be, run the business of, of Word, because Word was a lot smaller than WordPerfect back then. And he talks me into coming over and being the development manager of Word. So now I'm running a 60-person team, and now instead of battling Lotus, we're battling WordPerfect. And so we do that for another five years, and I'm, but I'm home, I'm playing all these games. And, uh, 1992, what an amazing year for games. Do people know this game? Dune 2 is correct. <laughs> uh, the first PC real-time strategy game, arguably the first real real-time strategy game, came out that year. How about this game? Anybody know this? I mean, it's alone in the dark. You can see that. But has anyone seen this game before? Yeah, a few people. It's funny. So, so this was the first uh, survival horror game. In fact, about five years later, four or five years later, I was uh, in Japan visiting Capcom for the first time. And they show me this game they're working on. Um, they call Biohazard. And, um, and I'm looking at it, and I said, this is just a, a clone of Alone in the Dark. And they say, yeah, yeah, Alone in the Dark. <laughs> and that, of course, became Resident Evil uh, in the rest of the, rest of the world. 
but also in 1992, of course, we had the creator here, John Romero, um, you know, the first sort of modern real-time strategy game with Wolfenstein 3D. So, okay, so I'm making words. I do that for another five years. Make this guy lots of money. Uh, but, um, and it, you know, and they're ready to promote me again. And so the next step up for me is to run a business. And they want me to go run PowerPoint. And, uh, and I say, I don't want to go run PowerPoint. You know, I've been doing Office for 10 years. And what I really love is games. I would love to run Microsoft's game business. And they're like, oh, Microsoft's game business. You don't want to do that. Uh, they, uh, they told me I would be committing career suicide. Um, and they, another vice president uh, hauled me in his office and he said, why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of this company, to go work on something no one cares about? <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't listen to them. I went and, uh, and started Microsoft Game Studios. And um, you just got to imagine, like, I mean, I'm just going to assume that everyone here in the room loves games. <laughs> everyone here is a gamer. Imagine just for a second that just through just sort of the weirdness of your career, you're suddenly in a position where you're working for this huge company that is going to give you tons of money and not care what you're doing with it <laughs> to spend in the game business. I mean, what would you do? I, I mean, I bet you would do what I did, which is just go crazy, you know? I mean, I went all over the world and, and signed up deals with every great game designer. I, I, I ever, you know, played their games and loved their games, and it was a fantastic time. And I could do a whole talk about this part of my life, and I have before, but it's not what this talk's about, so I've summarized it in a little, like, two-minute video for you here. And then I get a break right now. I forgot your name, whatever, my point is, hi, your head's on fire, oh damn, you must have got one of them, combustible heads, I read enough to go all about them, you're on fire, you're on fire. is starting to come true. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that was a really fun time. 
But um, by 2004, I was done. I'd been at the company almost 20 years. I was turning 40. I was having kids. I was just done working for a big company. And so I left the company and uh, just started to uh, try, to, try to find a way to stay connected to the game business and not have a full-time job, which is basically my goal every day today when I wake up. So, um, and you know, uh, one of the first things I started to do was uh, work as a board member for some different nonprofits, and I'm going to talk about a couple of these a little bit later in the talk. Um, I also worked as a board member for some uh, game and tech-related companies, and that's still something that's a big part of uh, what I do today. Um, Help some friends start a game company, actually a couple game companies. But if you're going to quit your job in a certain year, you know, 2004 turns out was a really good year as a gamer to quit your job because this game came out. I, uh, I played in the beta that summer and then, uh, then full time when it, when it released that fall. And uh, well, you know, this game can, can eat your life, but I. Uh, <laughs> I, I really had a lot of fun with World of Warcraft. I, I loved it so much that um, I started a 3D printing company a couple of years later to turn World of Warcraft characters into 3D color printed statues. And that's a little company that I still run today on the side. Um, but I want to talk for a minute about another battle that was going on in the year, kind of the decade uh, after 2000. Um, uh, in the U.S., and uh, I only played a sort of peripheral role in this, but it's, I think, an important one to talk about. And it was really started by a couple guys, this kind of crazy lawyer from uh, Florida, uh, Jack Thompson, and a state senator from California, Leland Yee. And basically their, their belief was that games were bad for people and that they should be uh, censored and regulated as much as possible. And they actually had some very early success. Um, uh, there was an early case out of Illinois and, um, where they got up to this uh, US district judge, so pretty high in the US legal system, and got him to rule that, uh, and this was after he had looked at four games, okay? He looked at four games and then said he found no conveyance of ideas, expression, or anything else that could possibly amount to speech, okay? So, <laughs> So basically what he's saying, he, what, what, the reason he chose those words about speech is he's trying to say that the First Amendment uh, uh, in the United States, which says that we have the right to free speech, and it's the amendment that protects artistic works, like movies and music and books and comics, um, that it should not apply to games because games do not convey ideas, okay? So it's pretty terrible, uh, but they actually managed to go state to state and get laws passed in many different states. Fortunately, the ESA, which is sort of the lobbying arm of the publishing industry in the U.S., came out and started fighting them. In my own state of Washington, they asked me to come and, and be their sort of spokesman and fight against a law in Washington. And to give an idea what these laws were like, in Washington the law said that uh, if games showed any violence towards authority figures, they could not be sold to minors, okay? Well, so what is an authority figure, first of all? Uh, certainly like policemen, but maybe it's also like a state legislator or something. Um, but, um, okay, so we can have like police shows on TV, we can have, you know, comic books where somebody's punching a police officer or something, but we can't do that in video games? I mean, it was really crazy. This law was immediately signed into, it was passed both the houses uh, of the Washington State Legislature and was signed into law. And fortunately, the ESA stepped in and blocked it. We fought it and we won. And uh, we won with prejudice, which means the state had to pay our legal bills, which was nice. And uh, this was, yeah, I know. And this was the start of starting to win these lawsuits all across the country. Um, which uh, culminated in uh, it going to, uh, one of these cases going to the Supreme Court in 2011, where fortunately the video game industry won. And so this was, and by the way, uh, only five justices out of nine voted for this, but that's okay, that's all, it only takes five. <laughs> um, and uh, by winning, uh, now video games in, uh, in the United States are have the same protection as movies and music and other works of art. 
and cannot be censored. So that's really an important thing, and hopefully the same kinds of battles are going to be happening other places around the world. Um, just a little postscript, uh, you know, uh, of those, those two guys who started this whole thing, Jack Thompson, he was uh, permanently disbarred by the Florida uh, legislature, or Florida Supreme Court, I guess, um, for his bad behavior not related directly to games. And uh, Leland Yee, just two months ago, was thrown in prison uh, for accepting bribes. So, good for them. It's nice karma. It's nice when karma works its way around, yeah. You know, meanwhile, the 2000s are moving along. Uh, of course, it's been a great time for, for everyone in the game business. This device comes out and really allows us to reach a much broader audience than we were able to get to before. And really, I think um, you have to be pretty pessimistic to not feel like this is a fantastic time for the game industry. The numbers are all going up. Uh, I mean, the mobile game business is, uh, you know, by this chart, is now the number two gaming business in the world. Um, and uh, of course, the, we can reach markets like China, which are huge, that we never had access to before. So it's really a great time for games. Um, uh, you know, I continue to work with lots of companies as an advisor, as a board member. Of course, virtual reality, I'm not really going to talk about it in this talk, but it's hard to avoid if you do what I do. Um, almost every company I talk to now has something to do with VR or wants to have something to do with VR. Uh, these are four VR-related companies that I do some work with, uh, either as an advisor or board member. But I, before I finish my talk, I want to talk about three things that are uh, an important part of what I do today. Um, the first is uh, working with the IGDA and the IGDA Foundation. I was an elected board member of the IGDA for three years, and then I moved to the IGDA Foundation, which is the nonprofit wing of the IGDA. And um, the biggest battle that we're fighting there is for diversity in the game business, trying to get more women and other underrepresented minorities into the game business. Um, and I do that not because I'm some social justice warrior, uh, you know, I do it because I was raised by a mom and a dad, they were both technical people, I don't distinguish, they were both equally influential to me, um, you know, obviously women can be just as good in this business as men can, and they should be equally represented, and if they are, you know, we, we end up with stronger teams that make better products. And I don't know if you've seen this graph, but it, what's happening, uh, especially in computer science, is, is really scary. Um, you know, the, what this shows basically is the percentage participation uh, between men and women in all sorts of different fields uh, for getting degrees from, from college. So like all the physical sciences are represented by that light blue bar, and all the lines are approaching 50%, which is what you want, half men and half women in the field. Computer science, it peaked in 1985, around 35%, and it's dropped ever since then, down to where now it's about half of what it was, which is, which is really shocking and, and, and really a terrible thing. So uh, there's a bunch of pe people trying to fight this today. Uh, I just, I just uh, saw a thing yesterday on Facebook uh, where that Harvey Mudd's graduating class of computer science this year was half uh, men and half women. So we need to do that in more schools. We need to, we need to fix it. One of the ways the IGDA uh, does this, not just for computer science, but in, in general to get more women in, in the business is uh, we do something called the Women in Games Ambassador Program where we fund uh, women to come to various uh, events. Uh, in fact, we're open right now taking uh, requests for scholarships to go to GDC Europe. Um, so uh, if you're an underrepresented minority, you should apply to that. Um, this is uh, just from GDC earlier this year. Um, the second thing that I'm involved with, in, and it's kind of a funny story to explain why I'm involved with it, but uh, I'm involved with um, the recognition of video games as art, video games as a true art form. And um, what that has to do with the Atari 2600 is, is sort of weird, um, but I'll try to explain it. I read this book, uh, Racing the Beam, it's a fantastic book about uh, the Atari 2600 machine, uh, and that made me want to write my own game for it. Uh, the Atari 2600 is like a really primitive version of the Atari 800, the old machine that I worked on, and so uh, 
I thought, maybe I can make a game for this, but what game will I make? Uh, what, what if Halo existed you know, 30 years ago? Uh, what would it look like on the Atari 2600 in 1977? So I built this game called Halo 2600. Uh, here's what it looks like. Um, you, one thing you got to know about the Atari 2600, it has two monochrome sprites. It has 128 bytes of RAM. So there's only 128 bytes of memory in the whole machine. Uh, and the entire program has to fit in 4K or 4,000 bytes. Um, so, uh, but I'm an old school programmer, so I had fun making a game on this machine, living within those constraints. And the, the game has 64 rooms. You battle your way through, and then you face a big boss encounter at the end. And if you can beat the boss, you unlock legendary mode. Um, so anyway, I made the game. It was fun. I put it out. I got asked to do the keynote at a conference called MIGS, Montreal International Game Summit. And so I made my talk about this, and I talked about the relationship between working within these super tight constraints and sort of the beauty that can come out with, when, you're, when you are in a very constrained environment. And I have a whole other talk about that that I can't do right now. But I compared programming the Atari 2600 in assembly language to uh, writing poetry, doing origami, uh, um, uh, impressionist painting, and uh, uh, black and red figure Greek vases, for example. So a lot of different stuff. But anyway, so I did this talk. Some people liked it. Um, meanwhile, a friend of mine, Chris Melisinos, is putting together the first video game show, the, uh, the Art of Video Games, that's going to run in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, one of the most prestigious art museums in the country, in Washington, DC. And so he asks if I, I could interview me for this, and I do that, and then he he asks if he can include Halo 2600 in the exhibit as an example of homebrew, you know, games made you know, on these old machines. And I said, sure. And there's hundreds of games in this exhibit. Um, and the exhibit opened. It was hugely successful. Drew more people than any exhibit in history at the Smithsonian. Then it went on to tour all around the country. In fact, it just ended its tour just, uh, just about a month ago. I think Houston was the last place it toured. Um, so very, very successful. But the weird thing that happened is the, um, the curator for new media at the Smithsonian, uh, he looked at the exhibit and he decided that there were two games in the exhibit that he really wanted to add to the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. And one was the game Flower by that game company, fantastic choice. And the other was my game, which was very surprising. But he liked, I guess, that it had this sort of retro, uh, sort of ironic take on a modern game, I don't know. But anyway, so all of a sudden, my game is now in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. Um, OK, that's fine. I can go with that. Um, they do another art show uh, where they're showing kind of uh, movies and uh, some other kinds of media-related things. Uh, this is just last year, and they include my game and Flower and that. Uh, I got to go out and speak as one of the artists, and that was fun. Um, so after this exhibit, they approached me and they asked if I would be interested in being uh, one of the commissioners for uh, what's, what's called the Board of Commissioners for the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And basically, there's 24 people who review and approve new, new uh, pieces of work that they're going to put into the Smithsonian. And they had nobody who knew anything about games or our, you know, our world. So they recruited me. So now, weirdly enough, I'm one of 24 people who gets to say what goes in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which is cool. So that's fun. <laughs> All right, finally, I want to talk about one more thing. Then this is, this is what I do when I'm not doing board and advisor stuff. This is like an, a passion for me. And it's, it's really the preservation of the history of the video game business. And you know, if you think about it, we are here at the dawn of a new medium that's going to exist for thousands of years. And um, it's, it's really up to us to, um, to make sure that we document and preserve what's been created. And especially in the arcade world, uh, things are being lost at, at kind of a scary rate. Um, so that brings me to this. I'm going to ask a couple questions here. What was the first commercial arcade video game? Some people said Pong, but yeah, yeah, I showed you at the beginning of the talk. I know, I'm trying, I'm trying to make this one easy. <laughs> it was computer space. <laughs> yes, I showed it, and hey, here's how the story goes. So computer space. So anyway, I got my hands on one of these machines. 
I bought it off eBay, and it was completely broken, and I fixed it. And I'm a programmer. I'm not an electrical engineer. So this was a big challenge for me. And I wrote a long story about it, which you can read at edfreeze.wordpress.com or just Google fixing computer space. And you will see as I go through trying to fix this machine. It has a tube TV. So that's exciting. I had to fix the tube TV first. And then I had to go through the three boards and debug this machine, which, by the way, these machines, these early games, no CPU. They're, they're just um, and or not gates. They're just made out of what's called TTL chips. Uh, no computer, no software. In fact, there's no, um, there's no ROMs either. The way they would do ROMs is they would just have diodes in the shape of what they wanted to show on the screen. So that's what that sp that's a sh rotation of the spaceship that you can see right there. Anyway, so they can't, computer space, two guys did that, a guy named Ted Dabney and a guy named Nolan Bushnell, who you should know because he started Atari the next year. So Nolan starts Atari. Well, OK, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what was the, f this is a trick question. I'm not even going to ask you guys this. The first color arcade game. I know that nobody in here knows the answer to this question. OK, you can try. Go ahead. What, what's the question? Tank. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The games I'm going to talk about are before that. But um, it's a good guess. So here's, here's how it goes. So Nolan and Ted, they, they create computer space, and they publish it through a, another arcade company called uh, uh, Nutting Associates. Game comes out, they, they actually get hired by Nutting Associates, they get in a fight with the founder, they quit, and they say, we're going to start our own game company, and they start a company called Atari. They hire an engineer named Al Alcorn, and he creates Pong. Um, so they make their first game, Pong, and they get really lucky, and it's a runaway hit. Big success. Al Alcorn goes on to make Atari's second game, which almost nobody knows, which is a game called Space Race. Um, after I fixed uh, computer space, I, I found that this fixing these old machines is really fun. So then I went out and I got a Space Wars and I fixed that. And then I said, well, I'm just going to go back to the beginning of these arcade machines and just try to get the old PC boards and then fix them and kind of move forward through history because I'm sick that way. And, and so I, you know, I did a Pong and then I did a Space Race. And the next game on my list was this game, Gotcha. And not many people remember this game, but this was the third game that they made. It was a, made by um, Al Alcorn. And uh, it's a special game for a few different reasons. It was the first maze game ever. Um, but you know, Nolan Bushnell has a real reputation with the ladies. Um, and it was the 70s and free love and uh, all that. And so he had the great idea that instead of having joysticks on the game, he would cover the joysticks in these sort of pink rubber domes. Maybe you can see that. So in instead of just pushing the joystick around, you sort of grab onto that thing and push it the way you want it to go. Um, I, you're not making this up. I mean, that's the flyer right there. Um, anyway, this was the first controversial video game in history. Uh, later, they, they ended up having to, um, having to pull off the domes, and the later versions just had simple joysticks because uh, they couldn't get it into certain locations. Um, but anyway, here's the thing. The thing is that there were a few scraps, there's a few little pieces of evidence that, color, that a color version of this was made. There's a story in an old magazine article about them going to this certain show, the AMOA show, and that they showed not just a black and white version, but a color version of this in October 1973. If a color version of this exists, it would be the earliest color arcade game in history. So I knew this. A few other people knew this. And that's why I was really surprised a few months ago when I saw this come up on eBay. And it's, I was buying old Atari PC boards, and this came up for sale. And can you see what's written in pen on the top of that? It says, Color Gotcha. This is like the whole trail, long lost color, first color arcade game. And it looks perfect. It has the color board. The schematic for that little daughter board on the side that makes it color has been out for a while. But nobody, people thought this game was lost. Lost to history. People, no, nobody knows how many were made. Maybe 10. 
So I bought it. Me and one other guy. Me and one other guy knew what this was, and we fought it out, and I won. <laughs> and, uh, and I got it home, and I started to fix it. And, uh, and it was really fun, and I had to fix a couple chips. Here's one chip I had to replace. Here's another chip I had to replace. And it's hard to fix a machine when you, the last thing I fixed was the video, so I had to do it before I fixed the video. But um, anyway, I'm getting good at fixing these now. Um, so I fixed that, and then I had to get the video working, and I, had to, and I built this custom little daughter card once I knew why the video wasn't working, and I built this. And anyway, I'm writing up a whole long story about this, which is, of course, it's called Fixing Color Gotcha, which I'm probably two weeks from being able to publish. And so I am going to show you. I'm, you guys are going to, only probably five people in the world have seen this, and please don't take a picture. I'm just going to show it really quick and then I'm going to go away, because I don't want, because... <laughs> I know, you can tell people who weren't here that they missed seeing the first color arcade game in history. Anyway, I'm pretty much done. I just want to sum up. And, uh, you know, what I want to say is to everybody, I mean, making games is hard, right? We all know that. Everyone here knows that. I mean, it was hard in the old days when you were like a kid, uh, you know, in your basement with one of these machines, and all you had was a couple ma manuals, maybe some magazine articles, and that was it. It was hard to find information. It was hard to get access to the machine. Even if you built a game, how would you distribute it? How would you sell it? How would you get money? It was really hard. And I think it's interesting that today it's really hard for like the opposite reason, you know? Like machines are plentiful, uh, information is plentiful, we have the internet, we have this great technology, we have these incredible engines. Uh, distribution, you can just upload something onto iTunes Store or Steam, and yet it didn't get any easier. In fact, it's, you know, it's probably harder than ever, but now it's hard because you have to compete with the best people all over the world. I mean, let's say you were crazy enough to want to build the next world's best role-playing game, you know? I mean, you'd have to compete against these guys from Poland who thought that they could make the world's best role-playing game. And, it, you know, it took them three tries, but they got there. <laughs> but, you know, we are, just in closing, you know, we are so lucky to work in this business, you know? We get to spend our time building these little machines of joy. And if we do that job really well, we get to see that joy reflected back at us in the faces of the people who play our creations. And for me, that's what it makes it all worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. We have still a, a moment for questions. I, I've recognized that you switched from Eddie to Ed in, in a moment in your career. Yes. Um, yeah. Does anyone has a question or comment? Uh, by the way, it was uber geeky. You know, it like was extremely geeky. Uber geek. Yeah. I, I can go geekier if you want. Yeah, hi, Ed. Uh, I was at your talk at MIGS, actually. The, oh, yeah. The one with the Greek vase at the start. Yeah, that was uh, one, of, one of the better talks I've ever seen in a competition. Oh, thank so, you. Wow, that's uh, a really nice thing th to say. This one does come second. Bun Bungie's, tr <laughs> Bungie's trying to get me to go back and uh, do it, because I, I did it there, and they, they really liked it. And yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they just asked me to come back and do it again this summer. And I'm like, I haven't done that talk in a couple of years, and I don't write them down. So yeah, yeah, right, right. I'll either have to go back and watch it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so because um, you were just talking about making a great RPG there. and I. You, and I don't know if you even have a perspective on this because I don't know how close you were at that time, but the, the first Fable game was kind of published on your watch. Yeah. And obviously Lionhead just closed down. I wondered if you had like any reflections on Lionhead, like wh how they struck you as a company at the time, because you know, I'm British and it's, it was a bit of a sad day when, when that studio went. Yeah, I mean, I, I was there for the start of that game. I believe I was gone before the first one was published. Um, I, I spent about an hour on the phone with a reporter from Edge the other day, and you can read his article. He, he quotes me like one time right at the beginning. So I told him all these stories and all this stuff. I mean, I guess the bottom line to me is that um, 
I just think Peter Molyneux is one of the most creative, fantastic people in the industry. And he has done so many incredible things over the years. And I think he's really been treated unfairly the last couple of years. And you probably know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just think he's an amazing individual. I, I've spent a lot of time with him personally. He's, he's a very uh, great, kind, generous person. And, um, and so, um, you know, I'm glad he's still making games. I hope he doesn't get hounded out of the game industry by people, you know, basically mistreating him. Because I think it would be a great loss. So I quite agree. Thanks. This is not a very hard question, but I'm, I, I'm dying to know. Um, two questions, really. First, how long did you spend playing World of Warcraft? Um, and the second one, what character did you play? 56 days, and I played a little gnome rogue, so a little... <laughs> okay, that's it. That's, that's, that's all you need to know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. All right. I saw the question there. Hi, Ed. So, first of all, total respect for the restoration project. And uh, my problem is I have a Vanguard Arcade waiting in my shed for this year's project. You have what? S uh, a Vanguard Arcade machine. So, I just wanted to uh, ask if I ran into serious trouble, if I could uh, contact you for help. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, please do. There was a guy, uh, a, a guy uh, restoring another computer space, and uh, he sent me a bunch of uh, a bunch of questions, and I, I helped him as much as I could. I'm I'm not a I'm not an electrical engineer, so a lot you know. But I have a few on call. I call my brother. My brother's my best. You know, I'm like, what's this open collector thing? And and he explains it to me. Um, I, Actually, what I'm working my way up to is I want to build my own TTL game. That's how crazy and geeky I am. So um, hopefully, a couple of years from now, I'll be on stage and showing my own TTL game in the style of 1973. We'll see. Fantastic. OK, we have uh, two questions here. Yeah. Hi. First of all, amazing speech. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> First, uh, how much did you have to pay for Gacha in color? <laughs> <laughs> well, you it, it isn't a secret. <laughs> you can look it up on eBay, so it's not a secret. Uh, I bought it for $760. So it came cheap. <laughs> uh, yes, my, my, my max price was higher than that. <laughs> OK, and second, what was the most exciting thing that you work on during the work in Microsoft? The most exciting thing I worked on at Microsoft. Wow, that's a hard question. It's like choosing your favorite kid, yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I would just say the early days on Excel are probably my fondest memories just because the team was super talented and I learned a ton from working with these guys. It's true I wasn't making a game. But um, you know, when you're a programmer, uh, you're writing code, and then something's coming to life on the screen. And it kind of doesn't matter if it's a spreadsheet or, or a game at some point. It's still that, that real thrill of being able to, able to create something and, see it and bring it to life. So those are probably my fondest memories, the early days on Excel. I have a question, personal question. Were you responsible for uh, this Easter egg in Excel where you could fly a sheep or something like that? I don't remember. There were a couple of Easter eggs. Every version of Excel had an Easter eggs. And people remember the, the there's a flight simulator one, which yeah. is actually after my time. There was also a Doom one, which was after my time. I was thinking about that when John Romero was talking about different places that Doom ran. Uh, they, they made their own. They didn't use the Doom code. I was responsible for uh, a few of the early Easter eggs. Um, that you wouldn't know. But one of them was based on a dream that I had. And the, in the dream, there was a Lotus 1, 2, 3 box. And it started shaking. And then it burst apart, and, and bugs crawled all out, all out or all around it. And so we recreated that as our Easter egg for one of the versions of Excel. Awesome, awesome. OK, the question here. Um, it might sound a little bit weird, but please bear with me. Um, if you could go back in time, let's say 30 years, and meet your younger self, and you, give, and you could give one advice to your younger self, what would you say? I mean, it depends how far I go back. I mean, 
For me, a real turning point in my career, I was, it was when, when I was first working on Word. When I, I was, it was the first time I had ever managed a big group of people. And um, was, so my first really serious job as a manager, I had 60 people working for me. And I spent the first three months of the job just, um, just trying to make everybody happy. And it was like the worst thing I could do. It, you kind of, it's a whole long story about how to get there, but the group had, would, had, was split into two pieces and they were at war with each other and there's just all this political crap going on. And, and one day I just got so fed up and I just, I just realized this phrase like it popped into my head and that is, if your job isn't fun, you're not doing it right, okay? And so that's what I, if I, I wish I had known that earlier, I would have told myself that, and I, maybe I would have explained what it means. And what it means is, you know, it's like you're responsible for your own happiness, first of all. It's not someone else's fault. But second of all, it, it, you know, you gotta do something about it, right? You know? Um, and, and, and probably the biggest thing that that phrase means to me is that was the point where I stopped caring, like, what other people thought. It was like, I'm just gonna come into work every day and do what I think is right. And either it'll work and we'll be successful or it won't and I'll be fired and that's fine. Um, and honestly, once I started having that attitude, everything got a lot easier. <laughs> so I would, try to, I would try to convey that core idea best I could. Okay, awesome. Uh, so Please join me here in the middle of the stage. I hope we will have this Digital Dragons here slide. This is the moment for last question. And the last question is, um, we were talking about going back in the history, um, but now today, what would be your advice for people who start creating games? So uh, do you think that there is a special market niche that they should pursue, like VR, we have Oculus uh, today showing their uh, hardware and stuff like that, or maybe there is a genre that you would recommend or any other advice for people who start? Yeah, I read this really terrible advice the other day from a, a, another famous person in the game business and it really pissed me off. <laughs> and basically he said, you shouldn't make a game today unless you find some blue ocean to make your game in. You know, and I could not be more on the other side of that. I think, I think if you want to make games, make games. And you should make, if you want to be in the business, you, you got to make stuff. Whether you're, if you're an artist, you have to draw. If you're a programmer, you have to program. I mean, look at John, you know, his talk here. The main thing people should take away is, God, he made so many games, you know. And he took a, a lot of games before he got to a game that you've even heard about. If you look at the history of Minecraft, same thing. I think the guy made 50-something games before before he made Minecraft. You know, you gotta make stuff. This is a business about making stuff. If you sit there and worry about, oh, is there a market for this? Or is this the, you know, the, the genre that other people are missing? That, that's like thinking like a business venture capitalist or something, it's not. And, and, mm, and honestly, yeah. those people don't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, there's so many times in this business where I've seen like, oh, the game, you know, uh, uh, oh, PC gaming is dead. Oh, RPGs are dead. Oh, you know, whatever is dead. Um, nobody knows. And no, all you, have, you just have to make one great thing. And all of a sudden, oh, RPGs are awesome. You know, <laughs> so, you know, just make whatever it is you're excited about. Make, you know, make lots of stuff. And, um, that, that's the way to succeed. Okay, uh, one, one last question, is, it, it came to my mind. How do you get the advisor like you to your game or company? It's like, uh, uh, you, you look only to uh, some exciting, uh, exciting ideas or uh, this is like uh, uh, only recommended by your friends and you have to go through whole you know, ladder of people to, to grab you? <laughs> I, there's not like a, simple answer to that. I have a lot of coffees with people. People, people are always coming to me and are getting sent to me to have coffee and I, I love having coffee with people and talking about their business and their ideas and what they're working on and, and sometimes that leads to a, a, a closer relationship, um, you know, an advisor relationship and sometimes those lead to board relationships but um, I, it's, I don't go out and seek them, it's just they come to me and um, I'm always happy to sit down with people and talk about games. I hope you will stay with us for uh, some time uh, just to give some uh, advice to our developers and companies who are here. So you know the secret sauce, look for coffee 
and uh, then <laughs> there is a th there is a opportunity you will have uh, uh, advice from this um, um, uh, person who, who made a bit of history of uh, worldwide gaming. Uh, honored. This was super exciting. Thank you very much for this talk.